All right, welcome class. I'm also gonna plug in my computer for a little extra power. Uh, welcome to chapter seven, part two. We're in the muscle system. Um, what you see in front of you is just the chapter seven PowerPoint. And again, all of these PowerPoints are on Canvas under files. So you guys have access to these to study. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make the screen larger. So we ended talking about muscle twitches. And now we'll talk about different types of muscle fibers. Um, you have two types of muscle fibers, kind of slow and fast twitch fibers. And slow twitch fibers are called slow because they contract slowly and they also fatigue slowly. They have lots of myoglobin, so that's kind of their energy source. They use aerobic respiration, meaning, meaning they will take in oxygen and glucose to create ATP. And they are darker in color. So we often call the slow twitch fibers um, the marathon or endurance muscle fibers. And because they're darker in color, um, you guys eat this dark meat in poultry. So where's the dark meat located in poultry, in chickens and turkeys? Does anyone know? You can put it in the chat. Where is, what is the dark meat? The dark meat in chickens is made up of the slow twitch fibers. You'll find dark meat in the thigh, the leg, and that's because that's where these dark um, fibers are, the slow twitch fibers, the fibers that contract slowly and fatigue more slowly. So in chickens and turkeys, their legs um, and thighs are doing a lot of their running. So those are their endurance muscles and they're darker in color because they have more myoglobin. They also have more um, kind of blood supply through them. The second type of skeletal muscle fibers are fast twitch fibers, and they contract more quickly. They also fatigue a lot more quickly. Um, they use anaerobic respiration, mean, meaning they create energy or ATP in the absence of oxygen. They get their energy mainly from glycogen stores, and they are lighter in color, and they're used by sprinters because they fatigue a lot more quickly. So in poultry, you find your white meat um, in the breast, um, kind of, I think that's the main part. I'm trying to think other where other white meat is found in poultry. Um, so that white meat in chickens and turkeys is made up of these fast twitch fibers uh, because they contract more quickly and fatigue more quickly. So you can impress everyone around the Thanksgiving table about the light and dark meat and fast and slow twitch fibers. Just letting more people in here. Um, so the skeletal muscle, the, a muscle in, so all of your skeletal muscles kind of have a blend of these two types, fast and twitch, but the distribution of the fibers is usually genetically determined. Um, so some people are predispos predisposed to have more fast twitch or slow twitch fibers, um, or you can kind of build those fiber types if you want to run a marathon or be more of a sprinter. All of these fibers are very energy demanding cells. So all of your muscle cells, um, they need energy. And they, this energy comes from either aerobic or anaerobic ATP production. So this is the idea that your muscle cells need to create energy in the form of ATP. And they need either oxygen, but they, some fi muscle fibers can do so without oxygen. And that's called anaerobic. Obviously, aerobic respiration is a lot more um, efficient and can create a lot more ATP. ATP is derived from, from four processes. Um, myoglobin, myoglobin is just the energy source where um, the sugar or glucose comes from. Let me look that up really quick. If you guys are still listening, just let me give you, because I was thinking the same thing. Let me look up really quick because I don't want to put you down the wrong path. Myoglobin is actually a protein. It's a red protein containing heme, which carries and stores oxygen in muscle cells. It's structurally similar to hemoglobin. So myoglobin is more the idea that it will um, store the oxygen that your muscle fiber cells need. Good question. All right, good. So how we create ATP is derived from four processes in skeletal muscle. Um, and these are the four different processes that create ATP, which your muscle cells need in skeletal muscle. So the first kind of step is aerobic production of ATP during most exercise in normal conditions. So normally during exercise, during normal conditions, your muscles are creating this ATP in the presence of oxygen, and that's called aerobic production. 
Anaerobic production of ATP um, happens during intensive short-term work. So your muscles can create ATP in the absence of oxygen, anaerobic, um, but not long-term. They can do this kind of in a, on an emergency basis, short-term work. Um, what they do is they convert a molecule called creatine phosphate to ATP, um, or they can convert to ADPs, which is adenosine diphosphate. So they each have two ATPs or two phosphate groups. They can kind of combine those to form one ATP and one AMP during much more heavy exercise. So that's how we create ATP. Um, and again, ATP is required for our muscles to contract. We learned about that, how ATP is required to kind of take apart the myosin head from the actin. And if ATP is in there, um, the myosin will constantly be connected to that actin, forming that cross bridge. And that's what forms rigor mortis um, after death. So muscle fatigue. So our muscles cannot contract forever. Um, fatigue is a temporary state of reduced work capacity in your muscle fibers. Without fatigue, your muscle fibers would be worked to the point of structural damage to them and all of their supportive tissues. So if you're constantly working out your muscles, you will damage those structural fibers, as well as the supporting tissues that surround your muscle fibers. Mechanisms of fatigue include acidosis and ATP depletion. Uh, so using up the ATP due to an increased ATP consumption or a decreased ATP production. And where acidosis comes in, um, acidosis um, can form lactic acid in your muscles if they're really working on overload. Um, and acidosis will lead to lactic acid, which you guys feel as the burn in your muscles after working out or going for a long run. You're feeling that acidosis, the lactic acid buildup. Oxidative stress um, is a mechanism of muscle fatigue. It's characterized by the buildup of excess reactive oxygen species. Um, and again, oxidative stress will just kind of be a buildup of these reactive oxidative oxygen species that are formed as a byproduct of um, your muscle contracting and other local inflammatory reactions. And you can probably all agree that you felt some of these before, you know, local inflammatory reactions, maybe swelling, um, you know, your skin getting red from working out or using a muscle too much acidosis. I know we've all felt that lactic acid buildup before. Um, if we work out a lot, no pain, no gain. Yes, Ryan, for sure. Um, types of contractions. There's two types that are uh, of contractions that our muscles can go under. And we call them isometric and isotonic contractions. And I, if I remember correctly, I think you do have a lecture exam question about of these types of muscle contractions. An isometric contraction has an increase in muscle tension, but no change in length. And an isotonic contraction, meaning the muscle is changing length and shortening um, with no change in the tension. And I think we give examples of each. So kind of, I'm going to just repeat what I just said. An isometric contraction means um, there's an increase in mus muscle tension, but no change in the length. So the muscle itself isn't actually shortening. So a good example of an isometric contraction were to be if you were going to kind of lean up against a wall and try to push that wall down, there would be an increase in your muscles tightening or tension. Um, but they wouldn't actually be changing length because you're not moving, the wall's not moving, but you are putting a tension on your muscles. So that's an isometric contraction. An isotonic contraction has a change in muscle length with no change in tension. So that mean, would be your muscles are shortening, contracting, moving, doing some sort of work. Um, concentric contractions is a type of an isotonic contraction. Um, so now we're going through two types of the isotonic contractions. So these would be types of muscles contractions that your muscles are doing work and changing. Um, concentric are where the muscle tension increases as the muscle shortens. So that would probably be similar to lifting a weight or lifting my cup of coffee. An eccentric contraction is a type of isotonic contraction in which the tension is maintained in the muscle but the opposing resistance causes the muscle to lengthen. Um, so those are just two types of isotonic contractions that there will be, I think, one question 
on your lecture exam about those. Muscle tone is the idea of a constant tension produced by body muscles over long periods of time. Muscle tone is responsible for keeping the back and the legs straight, the head in an upright position, and the abdomen from abdomen from bulging. So muscle tone, I mean, all of your muscles are constantly contracting. Even right now, your abdomen is contracting um, to keep it from bulging out. Um, especially the muscles in your neck, head, and back region. They're contracting right now as you're sitting up, unless some of you are just woke up and you're lying in your bed still. Um, the muscle tone depends on just a small percentage of all the motor units in a muscle being stimulated at any point in time, causing their muscle fibers to contract um, in a tetany type of way and out of phase with one another. So what that means is that, you know, these muscles that are holding up your neck or making you sit up straight in your back, some of them are constantly contracting as this tetany version, but they're not all contracting at once. So they kind of, some motor units will contract, relax, some others will contract and relax. But this muscle tone is really important for maintaining just your ability to sit up straight, keep your head up straight. Smooth muscles. So we talked pretty much all up until this point about skeletal muscle. Why don't the muscles feel sore when we breathe throughout the day? That's a good question, Cameron. So yeah, all of our other muscles, you know, when we get a workout, we feel lactic acid buildup. Um, I think it's the way that the motor units are being recruited. And again, that's a great question. So if you think about the muscles that help you breathe are your diaphragm, which sits below your lungs. The other muscles that help you breathe are the ones that go in between your ribs. They're called intercostal muscles. Some of them will contract when your rib cage expands to help you breathe in. And then others will contract to help to kind of contract your rib cage when you breathe out. And the only thing I can think of is they maybe contain some of this muscle tone. So they have the ability to contract for a period of time in a motor unit, but then they'll relax while others. So they're probably also made up of slow twitch muscle fibers. So the ones that are darker in color that have the ability um, to never fatigue and can kind of work, like think of a marathon runner. Good question. We won't really get into how lactic acid works, Julie. If you go into anatomy and physiology, um, and if you guys are really interested in this, I would encourage you to keep taking these courses um, because yeah, lactic acid, you know, basically, your, your body tries to maintain a constant pH level of all, you know, not only blood, but also the tissues. And when you have lactic acid basically builds up when your when your muscles run out of oxygen to use. So instead of they go through, they use anaerobic respiration to create ATP, but a byproduct, you know, there's a lot more steps involved is lactic acid production. So basically when you work out for a long time or you lift a lot of weights or you run for five miles, I used to be able to do that. Maybe one day I will go back to that. Anyway, when you go through that, your muscles use up the oxygen and then they have to anaerobically produce ATP without oxygen present. And a byproduct of that is just this lactic acid buildup. Um, yeah, there's more kind of steps involved. You get into how ATP is produced in the body, but uh, definitely go on and take, I think it's AP or anatomy 150 and 151. Okay, so going on to smooth muscle, smooth muscle cells themselves are non-striated, so they don't have the zebra-like stripes to them. They're small, they're spindle-shaped muscle cells. Sometimes we call them fusiform shape. What that means is smooth muscle cells are wide um, in the middle, and then they kind of taper off at the end. They usually have one nucleus. Their myofilaments are not organized into sarcomeres, so they contract in a little bit different way, which we won't really go through. The cells comprise all of your organs and the walls of your hollow organs. Um, they're controlled involuntarily, um, except the heart. The heart has its own type of muscle. Neurotransmitter substances, hormones, and other substances can stimulate smooth muscle, um, such as the uterus, for example. We talked about that, how a woman in a coma can give birth to a child because the uterus is made up of smooth muscle, and that's involuntarily controlled. So she'll have oxytocin thrown at that uterus to um, contract and push out the body. Cardiac muscle, um, so this is our third type of muscle. So again, kind of taking a step back, we went through skeletal, 
That's what makes up all of our muscles in our body. Smooth muscle makes up all of the kind of walls of the hollow organs. So think stomach, uterus, digestive tract, parts of the male reproductive system. And then cardiac muscle is on the heart. So your cardiac muscle cells are longer, they're striated, they, are, they branch, and they usually only have one nucleus per cell. Cardiac muscle um, does have this sarcomere arrangement, so that's what gives its striated appearance. And cardiac mu muscle contraction is autorhythmic, and what that means is that your, your cardiac muscle cells can start their own heartbeat and can maintain their own heartbeat. Cardiac, your heart is just an amazing organ, but if we were to remove the heart from somebody's body, it would continue beating for a while um, until it would run out of oxygen and blood supply to it. Um, but that's what we mean when we say the cardiac muscle contraction is autorhythmic. Cardiac muscle cells are connected to one another um, by specialized desmosomes and gap junctions called intercalated discs. You should know those, that's kind of the special characteristic of cardiac muscle cells. They all function as a single unit in that an action potential in one cardiac muscle cell can stimulate action potentials in adjacent, in adjacent cells. So that gives it the ability to be autorhythmic. The heart contracts as a unit, all the cells, and it can pass on the electrical signal to other cells through these intercalated discs. And again, it can stimulate its own heartbeat and continue it. Not forever, but for a little bit. So here are the skeletal muscles in the body. You have over 700 skeletal muscles in the body. And what's nice about learning these muscles is right down the midline of the body, a lot of the muscles on the right side, pretty much all of them are the same on the left side. So we have this um, kind of symmetry in our body with our skeletal muscles. Um, you guys will spend time learning these in lab, probably not all of them, the facial muscles have to do with facial expression. And then some of these you'll recognize the deltoid on the shoulders, biceps, brachii. We have a lot of muscles in the forearm, um, the front and the back. And then we have our strongest muscles in the body are in the quadriceps. So we have four muscles that make up your quadriceps on the front of your thigh. Um, and those are your, your body's strongest muscles. And then on the back of the thigh, those are your hamstrings. Um, the gastric nemius and the soleus are your calf muscles. Um, again, as you're learning these muscles, you'll notice some similarly, similarities to the bones you learn. So fibularis longus will be on the lateral side of the lower leg, kind of going along that fibula bone. So you'll notice some similarities there. And then on the posterior side, the hamstring muscles, you have a group of three um, you have the calcaneal tendon, which will connect to the gastrocnemius, your calf muscle, with the calcaneus, your heel, also known as the Achilles tendon. Um, you have the gluteus muscles. You have a gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. So those are all the muscles on your backside. You see this big triangular shaped muscle. This is your trapezius or more of a diamond shaped muscle. And then um, kind of underneath or below the trapezius, you have this large latissimus dorsi muscle. And those are the muscles involved in helping you do a pull-up. If any of us can do those, um, I'm sure some of us can in here. Uh, then we have um, on the back of the arm, you have the triceps brachii. So I'm going to kind of let you guys, you know, spend some time in lab learning these. Um, we'll go through kind of some of the skeletal muscle anatomy of what makes up each muscle uh, of the skeletal muscle types. A tendon you'll often see like the Achilles tendon. A tendon always connects um, skeletal muscle to bone. We will learn about ligaments that connect bone to bone, but a tendon always connects muscle to bone. And aponeuroses is a broad sheet-like type of tendon that will connect a muscle to a bone, but it more like fans out and is thinner. A retinaculum is a band of connective tissue that holds down the tendons at each wrist and ankle. So around your wrist, you have this retinaculum. It's connective tissue. It kind of looks like a piece of um, masking tape. And you can see it right here. Here's your retinaculum. It's like a wrist watch or a masking tape that keeps all of the tendons so that are coming from the muscles in the forearm that reach out into your fingers and it keeps them all together. And um, if you ever get the chance to dissect a cadaver, which is just an amazing um, opportunity, people who've donated their bodies to science, science are just wonderful people. 
um, because that's where we've, we've learned all about this stuff. But this retinaculum is kind of neat when you get to the arm and the forearm and the hand, you can cut through this and then all of these tendons will pop out. So you can see how the retinaculum really held them in together. And then you can pull on each tendon and see where each tendon came from each muscle and to see which finger it controls. So I don't know, I think it's kind of cool if you guys ever get the chance to do that. Skeletal muscle attachments always have an origin and an insertion. And the origin point of the skeletal muscle is where the attachment is at the least mobile location. So if we think about our biceps, which is on the anterior upper arm, the biceps origin will be closer to the shoulder, the least mobile part. And the insertion is always attached to the bone undergoing the greatest movement. So on your biceps, the biceps muscle will insert itself, I think on the radius, because when the biceps contracts, it'll pull your radius or your forearm um, up to flex. The part of the muscle between the origin insertion is the belly. Um, a group of muscles that work together are called agonists. So for example, your biceps, right below your biceps, is the brachialis muscle. They both work together to do flexion of your arm. So they are an agonist group. A muscle or group of muscles that oppose each other, so they have opposite actions, are called antagonists. So for example, a great example of antagonist group is the biceps on the front part of your upper arm, and the triceps is on the posterior side of your upper arm, because when one contracts, it'll flex, and when the other contracts, it'll extend your arm or stretch it out. And here's that example that I gave you. This is a great picture showing what we just talked about, the origins of the biceps brachii on the scapula, the insertion on the radius, um, the belly of the muscle. So this is showing a contraction of your biceps that's causing flexion of the forearm. Flexion is always decreasing in angle between two parts. Here's the triceps. Um, so uh, the biceps brachii is called biceps because it has two heads. And the triceps brachii, tri, has three heads to it. And when the triceps contracts, it'll extend or stretch out your arm. And those are antagonists because their actions are opposite to each other. Nomenclature for muscles, they are named for their location. So for example, the pectoralis muscle will be in the pectoral body region located on the chest. The size of the muscle, we have... Um, um, magnus, like your gluteus maximus, medius, they could be um, longus, brevis for short or long. The shape of the muscle, we have um, muscle shapes that are triangular, like your deltoid, quadrate, rectangular, round muscle shapes, like the ones surrounding your mouth or your eyes. We call them orbicularis. And then the or or orientation of the fascicles. Remember the fascicles were the bundles of muscle fibers Within each muscle, the fascicles could run straight. And an example of a straight muscle is the um, rectus abdominis, which is the muscle on your six pack that you all have. Uh, great news for you today. We all have a six pack, the rectus abdominis, but it's rectus because it runs straight right down the middle of your abdomen. We can see some people's rectus abdominis better than others because some of us have a little bit extra tissue on the top of it, which is totally fine. But that's an example of a straight or rectus muscle. And then we have oblique muscles that run at an angle. So that's how we name our muscles. They're also named for the origin and insertion. So for example, your sternocleidomastoid muscle has its origin on the sternum and the clavicle. And that's where we get sternocleido, the suffix. And its insertion is on the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So sternocleidomastoid, we often abbreviate this, this muscle SCM. And this one, you can feel it in your neck. If you feel your sternum and clavicle, and then you reach up behind your ear, you can kind of feel this muscle kind of traveling the lateral side of your neck. The number of heads, the biceps muscle has two heads. The tricep muscle has three. And muscles are also named for their function. So we have abductor muscles and adductor muscles, and those are muscles that cause abduction or adduction. So then kind of the, the rest of this PowerPoint goes through the muscles in detail um, that you guys will do a lot in lab, um, but a, a lecture question might be, what are some of the muscles of mastication? And mastication means to chew. 
So um, in terms of lab, you know, focus your lab studying on labeling, the, you know, the muscles knowing where they are, and then lecture might be more content-based questions, like which muscles help you chew or masticate. The temporalis, the mastic, mass masseter and the pterygoid. So this P is silent and it's called the pterygoid muscle. So the temporalis muscle, a really hard one to remember, is on your temporal bone. So it'll be on the sides of your skull, but it will insert itself on your mandible. So when it contracts, it'll help bring your mandible up to chew. Um, the masseter is this big muscle right on your cheek. It will also help control or like pull up the mandible to help you chew or chomp down. And then the pterygoid muscle, um, I don't know if it's seen on this picture because I think it's deeper underneath the masseter. But those are some of the um, mastication muscles. And the other ones that are shown are the muscles of facial expression. So you have this orbicularis oris muscle around the eye that helps you blink. The or the orbicularis oculi, excuse me, is around your eye. The orbicularis oris muscle is around your lips to help you blow a kiss. The buccinator muscle kind of is the muscle that lies in the dimples of your cheeks. You have zygomaticus muscles, a major and a minor. They will reach up and touch your zygomatic bone, but they will help you smile or form your um, kind of lips in an upward kind of rainbow smile. And then we have a depressor anguli oris on the sides of your lips that help you depress like a frown to your lips. Here are the tongue and swallowing muscles. Um, a lot of these muscles will be named with um, these, some of these prefix and suffixes of hyo and glossus. Glossus has to do with the tongue and hyo has to do with the hyoid bone. So a lot of the muscles that have to do with your tongue and to swallowing will be attached to the hyoid bone, which is in red right here, or attached to the tongue. And these will help kind of do the first act of voluntarily swallowing the food um, down the first part so it goes back into your esophagus. So here's your esophagus shown here. Um, the trachea is always in the front and the esophagus, which is what food goes down, is in the back. So these muscles will kind of squeeze, contract food, to push it down the esophagus. The esophagus itself is made up of smooth muscle. So once you do that first act of swallowing, which is voluntary, um, once food gets into the esophagus, smooth muscle is involuntary. So your esophagus kind of will squeeze the food down into your stomach. And that usually takes about six to eight seconds. Here are the deep neck and back muscles. These erector spinae muscles, this group um, runs parallel along the spine and they help you keep, keep the spine erect, which we all need to work on probably after sitting over our computers. And then you also have muscles attached to the base of the skull, uh, your deep neck muscles. The thoracic muscles, these are muscles that help you breathe. Um, ele external intercostals elevate the ribs for inspiration, internal intercostals, depress the ribs during expiration and the diaphragm all is always moving during quiet breathing. If it's hard to remember which one does which, your external intercostals help with inspiration. So breathing in, they elevate your rib cage, so make it larger and internal intercostals um, depress the ribs for expiration. So it, they have opposite letters. External is for inspiration and internal is for expiration, and then your diaphragm is always working. So I kind of mentioned before, the intercostal muscles lie between the ribs, and then the diaphragm, um, the diaphragm always looks kind of like a dome, and then it'll flatten out when you breathe in to kind of increase space in your rib cage, and then it remain, retains its dome shape um, to kind of push back in or make the rib cage smaller when you breathe out. So these are the muscles of the thorax um, to help with breathing. The abdominal wall muscles, rectus abdominis, that's your six pack, that's the center of the abdomen. This will compress the abdomen when you do a sit up. Um, the external abdominal oblique muscles are the sides of the abdomen. They also help to compress the abdomen. Um, and then the internal and transverse abdominis also help to compress the abdomen. Um, if we think about, you know, the rectus abdominis is down the middle of the abdomen. The external abdominal oblique is the most superficial 
abdominal wall on the side. The internal abdominal oblique is right, right deep to that. And the transverse abdominis is the deepest abdominal muscle. So kind of looking at a picture here, we have the rectus abdominis right down the middle. So it's the straight muscle. And then on the sides of the abdomen, we have these three layers of the abdominal muscles. We have the external oblique is the most superficial. And we can see that these muscles have been kind of cut and reflected back to show the muscles below them. The internal oblique is just deep to the external. And then the transverse abdominis is the third layer. So one, two, and three, these are three layers of abdominal muscles along the sides of the abdomen. The upper scapular limb muscles, we have the trapezius, the pectoralis major. Um, trapezius is on the shoulders and upper back. That's the one that makes up the kind of the diamond-like shape. It attaches to the base of the skull and then attaches to the spine as well as the shoulders. The pectoralis major helps to elevate the ribs. It's located on your chest. The serratus anterior helps to elevate ribs. It's between the ribs, the deltoids, your shoulder muscle. It will help to abduct your upper limbs. And again, abduct means to take away. So your deltoid muscle, when you abduct your arm, your deltoid muscle is contracting. Triceps is on the posterior arm. It extends the elbow. Biceps is on the anterior arm to help flex the elbow. And we'll get to pictures of these. Brachialis is below the biceps, also helps to flex the elbow. Bellatismus dorsi is the large muscle in the back to help extend your shoulder um, to kind of stretch out your shoulder. So here are some of the arm muscles in anterior view showing the pectoralis major, deltoid. Um, the serratus is kind of unique, the serratus anterior, because it looks like um, kind of a serrated edge of a serrated knife. So you can kind of see this jagged like appearance to the serratus anterior muscle. The biceps is on the front, the triceps is on the back. Um, and you can see here where the deltoid attaches to. The forearm muscles, there's lots of muscles in the forearm. Um, an easy way to remember them is a lot of the muscles that will be flexors will all be on the anterior side of the forearm. So remember, anatomical position has the palm facing front. So the anterior side of your forearm will have your flexor muscles, and the posterior side of the forearm will have the extensor muscles. So here's an anterior view of the forearm, the right forearm. You can see a lot of the flexor muscles on the front side. Um, a lot of times these flexor muscles will be named for what finger they will control with their tendon. So the flexor carpi radialis will go along the radial side, the radius side of the arm. Um, flexor digitorum muscles will have tendons that go out into all the digits. The palmaris longus will go to the palm. Flexor carpi ulnaris lines up with the ulna side, so the, the, lat, the, or the, um, the medial side of the forearm. The pronator teres muscles helps to pronate your forearm, which does the action of making your forearm kind of go down. Um, so you can kind of see those muscles on the anterior view. In the posterior view, you'll have a lot of extensor um, muscles. So if you think of flex flexion and extension of the forearm, um, your flexors will kind of flex your fingers down to make a fist. So those will be the action of the anterior forearm. And the extensor muscles will extend your fingers out. So stretch them. So when you stretch your fingers out, that's the action of your extensor muscles on the posterior forearm. So that's why they're called extensors and flexors because that describes their action in relation to how they're handling the wrist and your fingers. Pelvic floor muscles. You have lots of muscles in the pelvic floor, um, which I'll kind of leave up here. I don't know if you have a, a lot of questions about this, but you can see the male and female pelvic floor, obviously a little bit different, but kind of similar. Um, females pelvic floor muscles after giving birth, you can go through physical therapy to strengthen some of your pelvic floor muscles, because obviously um, your body goes through a lot after giving birth, so you want to kind of strengthen those pelvic floor muscles. Muscles of the hips and thigh, iliopsoas flexes the hip, We'll talk about flex, flexion and extension of the hip and what that means. Um, gluteus maximus is your backside muscle. It will extend the hip. Um, just think of flexing the hip as doing a sit-up. So kind of taking your torso down and touching your kind of nose to your leg. That's flexing the hip, kind of doing kind of 
try to reaching out for your toes or decreasing the angle between your torso and your legs. That's flexing the hip and extending the hip is more kind of opening wide that up. So maybe taking your leg back to extending the hip and opening the hip up. Um, the gluteus, so your gluteus maximus, gluteus medius um, will have similar actions because they're in similar locations on the hip. Quadriceps muscle has four thigh muscles. So this is on your anterior thigh. And here are the four muscles of the anterior thigh, the quadriceps. They're the strongest kind of group, muscle group in the body. Um, the big thing that your quadriceps muscles will all do is they all extend the knee. And what that means is think about extending the knee, kicking a soccer ball. So kicking your um, leg out, that's extension of the knee is like kicking a soccer ball. Um, the gracilis muscle, which I'll show you where that is located. The gracilis is located on the inside of your thigh. So it'll help to adduct the thigh, bring your thigh back to midline, as well as flexing the knee. And we just talked about extension. Extending the knee is like kicking a soccer ball. Flexing the knee is like kicking your butt. So did you ever do like butt kicks in soccer practice? You tried to kick your butt with your lower leg. That's flexing the knee is kind of trying to do that action. The biceps femoris, um, semimembranosus and semitendinosus, these are the three hamstring muscles. So they're located at the back of the thigh. They will also help to flex the knee. And again, they, if you, whenever you're trying to remember actions of muscles and what they do, if you think of a muscle contracting, contracting of the muscle means it shortens. And when a muscle shortens, it has to pull on a body part. So your hamstrings are on the back of your thigh. So when they contract or shorten, they're going to pull your leg up. So they'll try to kick your butt, do those butt kick action. That's what flexing the knee means. Rectus femoris, um, vastus lateralis. Oh, I think this is just a, basically the same thing that I just went through. This is another slide of the quadriceps muscles. So those four. So here are the muscles of the hip and thigh. The anterior view will show the quadriceps femoris. Um, the rectus femoris goes down the middle, and then you have a vastus lateralis and medialis on either side, with the vastus intermedius, the fourth quadriceps muscle below the rectus femoris. You can see here, see your gluteus muscles, and then the hamstring muscles on the back of the thigh. The muscles of the lower leg, um, the tibialis anterior follows alongside the tibia bone, um, it will invert the foot. So move your feet so they kind of point towards each other. That's inverting the foot. Uh, the gastric nemius is the calf. Um, it specifically, ne gastric nemius means belly of the knee. So, which kind of makes sense because your calf muscle is right below your knee and it's a big kind of belly fat muscle. It will flex the foot and the leg. So it will help to do those butt kicks and flex the foot. Plantar flexion is to kind of um, kind of stand on your tiptoes. That's what plantar flexion is, or to kind of plant your foot down or just do calf raises. Think of doing a calf raise, kind of standing up on your tiptoes. That's the um, action of the gastrocnemius as well as the soleus, which is another calf muscle right below it. So here we have the gastrocnemius. Um, on the front side, you can see the tibialis anterior is shown kind of right here. You can see in this picture how the tibia bone actually sticks through, and that's why we wear shin guards when we play soccer, um, to kind of protect the tibia bone. And then I think this guy is showing, or this view is showing a plantar flexion or flexion of the leg and the action of the gastrocnemius and the soleus helping stand on those tiptoes. Um, so think of ballerinas, you know, really any athlete probably has pretty, um, pretty strong calf muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, helping you stand on your toes. All right, so that is the end. Um, in lab, you might go through a couple more of these muscles in detail, but that is the end of this chapter.